Welcome very, very much to this segment of Conversations where I'm personally very, very pleased to welcome to the program Mr. Lewis O. Kelso. And Mr. Kelso is, of course, the chairman of Kelso Capital Corporation, is the founder of a movement, as it were, and an understanding of economics that has a tremendous significance in terms of the American and world economy. And Lewis Kelso, welcome very, very much to Conversations indeed. Pleasure to be here, Mr. Chairman. You've had a uh, view of economics which in a very real sense has been seen by many to be unique and revolutionary. It has implications in terms of our understanding the broad developments and problems that confront the American and Western economy. I wonder if maybe you could, at the outset here, share with us your, the, the distinct quality of your view of the evolution of economic development that perhaps sets you apart from the uh, more traditional or conventional methods of thought or, uh, you know, thought in terms of national and world economic development? Oddly enough, uh, the unique thing about Kelso, Kelsonian economics, is simply a small, very small fact. To the best of my knowledge, I have really no uh, theoretical controversy with any school of economics of any time, anywhere. Rather, uh, the secret mm -hmm. of Kelso concepts is that I start from a different set of facts. Among scientists, it's pretty well established that you can't have a theoretical controversy unless you do start from the same facts. The same thing is true, of course, in, in law. That's why juries must find the facts first before the theorists uh, begin to draw conclusions. Mm -hmm. The fact that I, oddly enough, stumbled upon is that there are two ways to earn an income. The conventional wisdom, all of the schools of economics, and that's everything from the far right to the far left and, and the middle included. The world of banking and finance, the world of labor, labor organizations, all assert mostly impliedly, because they don't really talk much about it. In other words, their, their views are so fixed that they don't think it requires any conversation. Mm -hmm. They assert and believe that there is only one way to earn an income, and that way, of course, is to work. Mm -hmm. The only legitimate, honest way that one can carry his weight in the world is to work. I assert that there are actually two ways. One way is to employ your labor power, and the other way is to employ your privately owned capital. By capital I mean land, structures, machines, normally represented in the modern world by corporate stock, because the corporation, the ownership of which can be subdivided almost indefinitely uh, through shares of stock makes it a convenient way for people to own tools. The only difficulty is that lacking an economic policy that recognizes the importance of both ways of earning an income uh, we have no deliberate effort, except the ones that I have started, to broaden the ownership of stock. They, they, to, they, yes, to they, broaden the ownership of capital. Yes, right. They, they, they more or less have assumed that the distribution of income to the general society will be through a labor relationship of the citizens exactly. to it, embodied in the Full Employment Act of 1946 that was uh, passed and so forth. That's and that's been part of the conventional wisdom and thought pattern of probably a good deal of the American citizenry, both in highly responsible positions and the general citizenry as well. You have to work in order to earn an income, and that is the way 
that you're able to gain income for life's purposes. The only other way mm -hmm. being, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, a declasse way, mm -hmm. that's welfare. Right. Now, uh, mm -hmm. or those, all of the transfer those who are mm -hmm. charged with, wealth, with supporting welfare, that is to say, consumers, whose, the prices of whose goods, goods and services that they, that they buy is packed with a certain welfare element, and, of course, uh, the taxpayers who are, um, I would say, victimized by government to um, pay uh, taxes in order that government can redistribute it. Mm -hmm. Has there been a growth of that in the modern experience? It certainly has, huh? We got off the, we got off the real uh, path of private property back in 1932. We were in the bottom of a Great Depression. A new administration, a new president with great style came in and collectively through the Roosevelt administration we asked the question, what can the United States do to ameliorate the effects of poverty? How can we make life easier to bear when people don't have enough income? Based on the general proposition of the government's responsibility to meet the essential needs of the citizenry, a needed that, kind of that by view. 1932 mm -hmm. was accepted. It yeah. was not. Mm -hmm. That was not by any means clear mm -hmm. before yeah. then. And there was great need. Of course. And there was great need, yeah. enormous need. Mm -hmm. Uh, the difficulty was, and incidentally, mm -hmm. once having asked that question. How can we make poverty easier to bear? How can mm -hmm. we help those who are poor? Once having asked the question, we then showed massive ingenuity in answering it, and hundreds of different ways in which uh, government could tax and spend mm -hmm. and distribute and, and help the poor, the underproductive, the, uh, the low income or the no income people. But ingenuity is no substance for knowing what you're doing. It's no substitute for knowing what you're doing. The sad thing is that it was the wrong question. Instead of asking, how can we ameliorate the effects of poverty, make it easier to bear, we should have asked, why are people poor? That's the right question. Now. What it illustrates mm -hmm. is that the right question is a lot more important than the right answer. Uh -huh. It may be answered wrong mm -hmm. initially. It may be answered wrongly for an extended period of time. But sooner or later, had we started with the right question, someone would have answered it with the right answer. Uh, I don't think it should have taken very long because um, if I ask uh, our viewers, uh, why are people poor? Mm -hmm. One of them is going to say rather soon, because he does, because they don't own enough capital. Well, what else is the measure? Mm -hmm. Now, once you ask that question and answer it with the right answer, then you're confronted with a more practical question: How can we get capital to people who don't have it? Well, it was answering that question that led me to realize that we were wrong at the policy level on the facts, wrong on the facts. That there are, in fact, two ways to earn an income, uh, and that if there is a legitimate way to enable people who own no capital to buy it and pay for it and own it, then we could solve that question. Uh, this is particularly important because the way in which goods and services are produced has been changing uh, rapidly, really, since uh, 1776, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the time when we invented the art of invention and began deliberately 
creating machines and tools and processes to eliminate labor, if you will, to produce goods more reliably, in greater quantities, and with less toil. And if we tried to make an input mix between the technology that could be embodied in the corporate stock and labor's input to that, it's increasingly the technology or the it's outerings of our consciousness, yeah. in a sense, that is responsible it's for the actual production. increasingly the tools, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. If you think of capitalist land structures, machines, and to some extent uh, intangible property, like the concept of the firm, or patents, which, have, which are intangibles, but uh, have their property characteristics conferred on them by law. Um, between uh, 19, uh, 1776 and today, what you have had going on is a process of changing from labor intensive to capital intensive. Now, if I, if I may call people who work through their labor, and that's I, I, it's everyone who uses his body to produce goods or services, whether it's his mind or his muscles or his acquired talents or his genius or, or whatever it is, let's call the laborer the labor worker, the man who works through the powers of his body, conferred on him by nature in the first place and, uh, and improved through his own efforts, his education and his experience, apprenticeship and what have you. And in this sense, we would mean labor in all its sense, from bank president to common from laborer and precise so, right. and okay. from scientists uh -huh. and mm -hmm. from theoreticians mm -hmm. and engineers uh, to um, the men who uh, wield shovels and, and wheel wheelbarrows and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, as we transited from labor intensive to capital intensive, uh, the people who came more and more into the picture are what I will call capital workers, people who work through their privately owned capital. Now, our method of changing uh, in, in production from labor intensive to capital intensive should, if you, if you believe the logic and uh, Adam Smith's rationale for a market economy, we should have been changing in our way of participating in production. More and more people should have become capital workers as labor work uh, diminished in its contribution to the whole. My guess is, and I think this is a pretty, pretty accurate estimate, that in 1776, about 5% of the total input into production came from capital. We were an agrarian economy. The main form of, of uh, capital was land. Land was cheap. There was lots of it. And you couldn't do much with it except through heavy applications of, of uh, labor workers. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what you did with it, it took a lot of labor work to uh, to make it productive. And that was probably true throughout a good deal of the human experience. Throughout. Mm -hmm. for, from 1776 mm -hmm. backwards yeah. to the mm -hmm. to the Big Bang or whatever mm -hmm. it is yeah. that started the universe, that certainly was the rule, mm -hmm. and it was dominantly true through most of the period. But what happened in in 1932 was that we were no longer able to produce that level of goods and services through labor work. I'm sorry through capital work and distribute it through labor. The, um, the efforts, of course, had been going on since uh, perhaps the earliest part of the 17th century. Um, the initial response and the response of the uh, New Deal was to try and rig the price of labor. We adopted such things as the minimum wage law, the wage and hour law. Uh, we uh, empowered labor unions to get together and to, uh, in a sense, coerce society to raise wages. Right today in New York, you have a strike uh, going on in uh, two major 
transportation systems to get more pay and other, other advantages for the same work input. No one's talking about working harder, working longer. That's not what's been going on. So that the experience from 1932 on has been a collective effort through, through labor, the only recognized legitimate way to engage in production, to get more and more pay for less and less work. When I s thought about that most carefully, and I thought about it consistently from 1929 on, when I began to really pull together my thoughts and wrote with Mortimer Adler, The Capitalist mm -hmm. Manifesto, in 1958, published in 58, uh, we added a second book in 1961 called The New Capitalist was a bad title because it was really a book about finance. In that book, we predicted that if this society should keep on encouraging technological change through which we grew more and more capital intensive, less and less labor intensive, through which we deliberately and systematically eliminated jobs and tried to distribute the income through labor, as we do through a national economic policy that says full employment is the way to have prosperity, we would do two things. We would absolutely ravage the integrity of the currency with inflation, because when you uh, rig the price of labor so that you get more and more pay for the same work input or diminished work input, what you're doing is packing welfare into the wage base and calling it wages and salaries, which it is not. So that you're you're falsifying uh, you're falsifying Adam Smith's basic laws. Smith said, in a free market economy, if you want income, produce something. If you want more income, produce more. We weren't doing that. What we were doing is producing it less and calling it more which is a quite different game. Because the production increasingly was a result of technological exactly. instruments embodied in stock exactly. that was not really open as an option to the vast majority not of enough. the citizenry in 1929. And it's still, and it's still not. Right. It's still a relatively narrow That's base of the citizenry that has a viable holding of exactly. uh, ownership in the, in the stock system. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think it's appropriate now to, to ask why. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we do know how to bring together the, the materials with which we make machines and automatic processes. We know how to do that. I don't anticipate that anyone would dispute that the economy of the United States today, and in a sense the economies of the whole world, have greater capability to produce goods and services and to produce capital instruments than ever before in the history of man. However, the world of finance, and for some strange reason, the world of policy, economic policy, is um, blind, colorblind, or, or, or um, object blind to that second way of earning an income. For the general citizen. For the general citizen. As a means of distributing income. And we, uh, yes. In other yeah. words, mm -hmm. we, um, the logic of capital formation is a pretty simple process, always has been. It is the logic of buying something in the way of, a, of producer goods, tools that will produce goods and services, on terms where it will pay for itself. Out of its own earnings. Out of its earnings. Mm -hmm. If it didn't, you can readily see that every step in technological advance would have set the world backwards, would have lowered the standard of primitive man, and frankly, mm. he couldn't afford it. Yeah, right. yeah, uh, yeah. He was living like an animal to begin with. If it didn't, it would be a bad business venture. Uh, exactly, investment. Right. exactly. So yeah. capital has paid for itself. Uh, otherwise, where did it come from? Uh, man, mm. primitive man, started out as an animal with, mm. with an animal standard of living. Mm. Uh, 
There is, however, as the world of technology gets more sophisticated, there is always naturally a risk that the capital equipment or capital instrument might not pay for itself. There are assurances built into the system against that. Financial losses, aren't there? Uh, they can be built in against that. But yes, yeah, they but were built in, but no. they be were built in the wrong way. Well, all right. um, throughout the business world and the practical world, uh, risks are commercially insured. Obviously, if you have enough wealth, you can self-insure any risk. But the whole industry of insurance is a is a demonstration that nobody in general has that kind of wealth. Uh, if you have to self-insure your house, in other words, if it, when it burns down you take the whole loss yourself, you're probably not going to have a house. You certainly are not going to have trains and ship lines. You certainly are not going to have great buildings. Uh, you're not going to have much of anything that looks like civilization at all. Without that, without that commercial insurance, which takes a little premium for everyone who feels that that risk is a threat to them and uses those accumulated premiums to reimburse the one who actually suffers the risk. I wonder if something like that couldn't be applied to the, to the, to the economy in broad general terms. Well, it could, mm. but it hasn't been, yeah. and that's mm. the odd thing. Mm -hmm. in, in throughout the world of finance, access to credit to buy capital is insured with self-insurance only. That is to say, you have to put upfront money mm -hmm. or down payment or collateralization, that is to say, put a mortgage on one piece of property to buy another. Uh, a typical example would be this. A group of entrepreneurs have thought through a business plan very carefully and they want to acquire a business built around that plan. Let's say it costs a million dollars. If they present a feasibility plan, a feasibility study, that shows how it would work, how it should project out, studied the market, uh, studied the uh, technology, uh, to a, a banker, it's the typical way to finance growth. The banker, when he is persuaded finally that it is a feasible project, that is to say will pay for itself, will say, all right, I'll make the loan. What he means is, I'll loan you two-thirds of it if you'll put up one-third, or I'll loan you three-fourths of it if you'll put up one-fourth, or maybe he's saying, I'll loan you half if you'll put up half. Um, what he is requiring in that case is insurance in the form of self-insurance from the entrepreneurs that if this thing doesn't pay for itself, he's going to be protected. Now what is missing is commercially available insurance. A, a method of finance, method of acquiring productive capital, the ownership of the other way to produce income, is, is limited to those who can self-insure, which is another way of saying we have a financial world designed to make the rich richer and to keep the poor capitalists. And it more or less has done that. And it's ex exactly what has done it. Mm. In uh, 1776 or soon after that, Benjamin Franklin, in one of his writings, estimated that 5% of the people own all the capital in, in the, the colonial economy. Now, it was an agrarian economy. Land was the dominant form of capital. And as we commented earlier, labor was terribly important. Uh, we were an economic democracy in colonial times because labor was the dominant form of productive power and everyone except a few cripples had it. So to get out and work the land, which was exactly. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or, or build the buildings yeah, or build right. the ships or right, right. build or make shoes or whatever. But labor's ratio of contribution to overall production was what more reasonable in terms of a labor distribution system than it would be in the modern experience. Well, mm. uh, we were operating on the human scale of economics. Mm -hmm. 
because labor was the dominant form of productive power and everyone had it. All you had to be is ambitious enough to want to live well and get in and, and do your very best and you could support yourself. So an economic democracy to go along with the political democracy that we were exactly. embodying in our constitution. That's the mm -hmm. point which few, if any, lawyers today understand. And certainly no politicians, I shouldn't say that, there are a few. A few have been reading me mm. uh, and are beginning to wake up. Mm -hmm. There are two basic forms of power in peaceful power in modern in the modern world. And I guess in a sense in the ancient world too. Those are political power, the power to make and interpret and administer and enforce the laws. That's what the American political revolution was all about. Giving everyone not everyone initially, but it was the first step. Women didn't get the vote till 1922. Mm -hmm. uh, but extending the extending political power to all people, haltingly at first, but it was perfected uh, decade after decade as we went along. We were already a, de a dem uh, an economic democracy because we were dependent on labor, and we all had it. Mm -hmm. Everyone had it. Fabulous thing. Between 1776 and 1983, the relative participation in production of capital workers and labor workers has approximately reversed, flip-flopped. Now, when, it, when the conventional economists, who believe there's only one factor of production, Keynesian, Marxian, Neo-capitalist, you name them—they're all there. classical. All of those, right? Yes. Uh -huh. If they're mm -hmm. an economist mm -hmm. uh, in the conventional sense, they believe there's only one way to earn income. Uh, or if they don't, then we have a serious problem. That is to say, it is a very pervasive fraud that they're engaging in. If they know there are two ways to earn income, and they're running the world in in such a way that only five percent of the people can own the other way, in other words, if they understand what they're doing by causing the world to have all of its capital today owned as it was in Ben Franklin's day by 5% of the people, which is the fact. All the studies that have been made in the last half century show that, and most of the studies have been made in the last half century. Uh, then, of course, it would be different. I have to believe that there's some kind of blindness, that this isn't really a conspiracy between economists and, and bankers and investment bankers and politicians. Um, and establishment it's, it's interests. It's that blindness. Mm -hmm. It's that, that element that Hans Christian Andersen alluded to in his story of the little boy who didn't believe the conventional wisdom mm. that the emperor had a new suit of clothes mm -hmm. and said, but, but the man is bare, yeah, he's yeah, naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's somebody's got to discover that. I've discovered it, but it's only important when the world of finance discovers it, when the world of labor discovers it. And when the nation as a whole begins to discover uh, the, the nation as a whole exactly. idea that exactly. there could be expanded ownership of the means of production, technological means of production, to the general citizenry as a matter of economic, national economic policy, as a legitimate means for us to distributing income among our citizenry, rather than having them have only a labor Absolutely. relationship, which characterizes we, about 95 percent of our population yeah. currently. As yeah. we change the method of producing goods and services, or contributing individually to the production of goods and services, it's elementary that we have to change the way in which people participate in production. Ideally, in an advanced industrial society, we would have a national economic policy of lifetime employment from adulthood to death, in which people enter the economic order as labor workers and service workers and pick up uh, more productive power as capital workers as they go along and emerge from the hurly-burly of the world at, let's say, 
an appropriate retirement age, which may vary with different people, and continue to be productive the rest of their life as capital workers. Now, several things have to happen. You have to have feasibility insurance commercially insured and not self-insured. Otherwise, you continue to make the rich rich. The employee stock ownership plan, one of the eight tools that I have invented to accomplish that, very poorly understood. Mm -hmm. uh, the world has totally mislabeled it as a, a kind of a deferred compensation, a sort of profit sharing plan, a sort of pension plan. Um, it is exactly the opposite of every one of those. It's amazing in a sense that there are, I think now, literally hundreds if not thousands of these in place with so few people really understanding the principles behind it. Well, it's They're beginning to understand that, the principles yeah. in, real, in a real sense, but it's having a, do you understand what I'm saying? It, uh, but, it, but, it, but it's not quite like that, uh, Harold. Uh, uh, there are some five to 6,000 financing, uh, I won't say financing, some five to 6,000 financial arrangements called ESOPs, or Employee Stock Ownership Plans. Uh, right. Only a handful actually are, because only a handful of people understand that the ESOP is the only device so far in the American economy that makes credit available to people who don't already own capital. It enables people from a cold start to buy capital, pay for it out of what that capital produces, and become increasingly labor workers with the second a, uh, method of producing income and if they are under such an arrangement long enough they can retire at the end uh, totally economically self-sufficient that is to say they can live on their capital so they could have capital formation that could be accomplished in a way that the ownership of technological instruments that will pay for themselves which is the logic of business finance be made available increasingly to the general citizenry so that the benefits of those who have had a position of being able to invest in those technologies, that could be made available to the general citizenry as a way of building toward a viable portfolio of ownership of the technological instruments that's as an instrument true. of employee, income distribution. That's absolutely and true. And that's the beginning to dawn as a policy direction that we should aspire toward nationally. Yeah. It is. Uh -huh. Now, the employee stock ownership plan only does that for corporate employees. Mm -hmm. That's a very important body of the world's people, but it's there are a lot of people left out, mm. like elderly people, like um, uh, crippled people, like uh, people who are artists and, uh, and thinkers and writers and teachers and, and all the others. There are seven other techniques built on precisely the same logic and which would be precisely as efficient and quick, actually quicker, uh, to do that. So there are plenty of tools to do it. There's another thing, though, that has to be brought in here. Yes, in the course of pretending that labor is the only factor of production, uh, and using that um, uh, falsetto word productivity, which is a word that enables you, enables labor unions, enables policymakers, enables corporate executives to attribute the productive input of capital instruments to the people who work with the capital instruments but don't own them. Now, that process carried out through various um, uh, aberrations, really aberrations, in a private property society or one that pretends to be, has caused the attenuation of property in productive capital that is capital owned uh, in, in equity form through stock or directly through capital instruments, has caused an attenuation of that property to where the average capital owner today collects only one-twelfth of the wages of his capital. Another way to say that is capital is 12 times as powerful as it appears to be. And it probably is more like 20 times more powerful than it appears to be because we operate an economy that 
strangles the consumer's income sources. Uh, it strangles it, his ability to earn more through labor by technologically eliminating him. Uh, and it strangles his ability to become a capital worker because it denies access to capital ownership except to those who already have substantial amounts of it. And most people haven't had that most much extra don't. left over in order to make those kind of investments in the traditional pattern. It has been a, a problem that results in 5% of our population owning virtually all, if that's correct, that's of the exactly corporate all. stock or it's ownership of the technology producing yeah. the it's bulk of the, of the production. In rather. terms of mm -hmm. dynamics, it's mm -hmm. even far worse than that. If you define a capital worker family as a family that earns half its spendable income from capital sources, you're talking about one-tenth of one percent of the population. Part of that is due to the fact that we have so debilitated capital ownership that, uh, that the owner can only get a twelfth of what it produces. The other is that we've so concentrated the ownership that, um, that this uh, foolish game would blow up in our faces if, um, let's say, if the Hunt brothers got the total uh, income flow, got the wages of their capital paid regularly, uh, like uh, their labor wages if they had ever worked. I doubt mm -hmm. if any of them did. Um, the world won't work this way much longer. We're, we're uh, piling up the accumulation, uh, the income accumulations of these excess holdings. People who have productive power that they can't use the yield of. Uh, the purpose of production, said Adam Smith, is consumption. What happens when a family discovers that it can become a capital worker, usually because they inherited enough mm -hmm. capital to start this self-insurance process. And they produce from that capital, or a combination of their capital and labor, uh, all the income they want to spend. Most of the world doesn't understand that that's even possible. But the cruel facts of life are that the consumer standards the lifestyle of the 95% who own no productive capital is controlled by their income. That's why we don't understand it. The lifestyle of the 5% who do own the capital is controlled by their virtue. But, um, but again, uh, things are based on what the majority understands, not what the minority understands. Adam Smith said the purpose of production is consumption. You have to then think through what that means. What is the significance of producing twice as much as you wish to consume? I mean, it's a free country. Pick your own lifestyle. But what happens if you want to, if you want to produce twice as much as you desire to consume? Put it in other terms. If the ideal economic life is lifetime full employment as a labor worker at one end, as a capital worker at the other, productive throughout life, no need for welfare, no need for social security, no need for pensions, just your own productive power uh, based on what you own. You own your labor power, you, you own your capital, and you have to have integrity restored to the property of that capital so you collect its wages. What happens when you have the ability to produce uh, one, one full lifetime uh, income. And then you get the ability to produce a second based on your own lifestyle. And then a third, and then a fourth, and then a tenth, and a hundredth, and a thousandth, and a ten thousandth. Mm -hmm. What happens to the rest of the world? Which does tend to happen with That's the That's exactly what's going on. That's exactly the, what's going on. Because the benefits of the capital uh, being embodied in technology that pays for itself continues to build to the benefit of those who are able to make those investments at a steady The one who owns pace. it. The one who owns it. Right. Now, he may be eroded, mm -hmm. but to the extent ownership exists, mm -hmm. it's in that tiny class. Mm -hmm. So that we're simply violating Smith's and J.B. says basic laws. 
for the rich, the purpose of production is not consumption. It is production. And what you have then is the minority producing for the majority, which is another way of saying you're making parasites out of the majority. And I don't think the majority would really like being parasites if they understood it. If they really understood they what really the situation... really understood it. Um, What's well, if they could see some alternatives to the conventional patterns in which we're asked to function? Of yeah. course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the prologue to the Constitution, which we call the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution itself, incorporate some very basic laws, basic to democracy, but basic to economics. But they can't be very useful to economics if you get the facts screwed up. In other words, if you think there's only one way to earn an income, and there are two, and the one that you don't see is more important today than the one that you do see, not that you could ever eliminate labor, it's just that you could eliminate a lot of labor workers, mm. millions. My estimate is that if you pull out the transfer payments, and the boondoggle, which is, which is welfare disguised as a job. This is mm -hmm. government subsidized jobs pursuant mm -hmm. to the national economic policy mm -hmm. full of full employment. employment. Mm -hmm. If you pull those out, I think you've got probably 45% unemployment in the United States, day after day after day, and it's, it's diminishing. Uh, you cannot, obviously, uh, carry that on indefinitely without totally destroying the institution, institutions of the society. Um, your property begins to vaporize. Well, if 11 twelfths of it has gone, have gone already, uh, the, the property rights in, in uh, producer goods. If the excess accumulation of wealth built up by those who won't consume its equivalent, and who can't take it with them, if they could take it with them, it would solve the problem. A couple mm. generations, we'd be back to the Stone Age. They would take it. Um, and you get international uh, debts, which are simply reflections of the, uh, the, the local debt. The internal debt of the United States is around $6 trillion, mm. figures that are incomprehensible to people. The international debt is many, many trillions of dollars. It can't be paid, and it won't be paid. And the quality of life is going down. The institutions that involve the use of uh, currency uh, are going to blow up. Uh, at the moment, yes, we are told that inflation has been controlled. Well, there's never been any mystery about it, even uh, from 1932 on, from 1929 on. Put we, us through a depression to do yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we know uh, how to control inflation. <coughs> throw enough people mm. into poverty mm. and onto welfare, mm. and uh, and it runs fine as long as the people will go for that. A little discipline. The people paying the price to control inflation mm. are the ones who can least afford it, mm. and it's not going to change. Um, we made a big mistake by not discovering that other little fact, that hidden fact, that there is another way to earn income. We've also failed to discover that you can't create jobs. I'm sure that's bad news for a lot of people, including Congress that's now spending $5 billion on a counterfeit jobs program. program. Particularly if so many of the job functions are going to be running counter to what a technologically oriented productive system would be able to introduce into the yes, production of the question. economy, but is not able to because they feel that there is going to be labor displacement and that seemed to be something that is wrong. It might be that if there's an alternative way for distribution of income, some of those things could be more encouraged to the benefit of the overall society, so long as there's a way of people seeing an alternative system of income distribution. Well, whether they see it or not, it's here economics, right. and it's going to happen. Right, okay. Right. Um, hmm? When right. technological change, which is the process of harnessing the laws of nature and making nature work for man, mm -hmm. Nature is not going to be frustrated by politicians, nor by anyone else. Uh, when nature, uh, through man's genius, is harnessed and eliminates jobs, those jobs cannot be created again. 
In other words, if we were able to screw up nature that effectively, I'm sure nature would start up, uh, start a new world somewhere else and shut this one down. Well, there are people um, who would try to argue that we can go through like with service economies and we can go like the buggy whip makers became automobile assembly line workers, they'll become computer maker workers and that they could build that kind of extension in. But I think that that's running up against the technological realities of the input mix between labor and technology. It's something which is increasingly technology and will be as we enter an informational environment. It runs up against politi Particularly. political mm -hmm. realities yes. also. Yes. A totalitarian society can do that. Mm -hmm. A totalitarian society can say there is only one way to earn income and ram it down the public's throat. Now there are alternative ways in which we could distribute income to the general citizenry other than this labor relationship that most of the people tend to relate to. It is possible for capital formation to be seen as able to be formulated in terms of its future productivity rather only than in terms of past savings that we've been able to garner from it. We can apply the principle of business logic to benefit the general citizenry providing an alternative system of income distribution increasingly as capital workers to the general citizenry. And there are various instruments besides ESOP, which is the major pioneering one that you've been involved in. Maybe you could touch on what some of yes. these other ones are, if you could, yeah. that could involve Firstly, these principles. Firstly, let me divorce And are the, are the bodies of law in place that could permit us to move ahead into these territories, uh, into these new systems of income, you know, financing arrangement and so forth? Or are there some legislative or legislative or, or legal uh, structures that are needed? Or are we almost, in a sense, able to begin to move in terms of the structures in place? Firstly, let me divorce myself from the word productivity, which you used. Did I? I meant to say pro. That's a hoax word, and yeah. I'm not going to be hoaxed on it, mm. since I uncovered the hoax. Mm, right, okay. Um, yes. Mm. But, but, but you understand but, what I but, meant. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. there are only, uh, the world thinks there's only one way to earn a living. I say there are only two. That's not a big difference, but it's a pretty important difference. Right, right. Uh, but there are other technologies built, that is financial technologies, built on the logic of the ESOP that can be used. And uh, I'll give you examples of some. Uh, the logic can be applied to the building of personal, to the financing of personal homes. Uh, today, using our best conventional wisdom, if you buy a $100,000 house, which would have been uh, about a $7,500 house 20 years ago, uh, you will pay $500,000 for it, or $600,000 for it, which means there's so much fric friction in the, uh, in the uh, ill-conceived system that you have to pay tribute to stupidity, financial stupidity, in the ratio of five or six dollars to one to get a house. A house financed through residential capital ownership plan financing, uh, once legislatively implemented, and again, the logic is already demonstrated by the ESOP, so all you need is, is the will of the people saying, we're more able to build houses today than ever before, why don't I have one? Why can't I afford one? May I interject, if I may? That yeah. The logic is well supplied in terms of a, a guideline to these other systems by a, a Kelso ESOP, not necessarily those that are called ESOPs, which are not. Absolutely. Uh, just no. to make the point. that all right. the, Your, uh, your uh, point uh, is uh, well taken. Uh, we have uh, had to, in, precise in, um, in um, the last year, we have stopped using the generic term for our own investment banking purposes. We are the the first to use these tools as investment banking tools. And in the case of the ESOP, we have called it the Kelso ESOP, uh, locked together, and um, have tra registered the trademark. So, yeah. Too bad that it had to be, that it, you had to go it that way. too bad that it had to be, but keep the too many people are putting the label on something, calling it an ESOP, and hoaxing the public. Yeah, right. Okay. And hoaxing employees, well, and hoaxing labor unions. Okay, yeah. Well, but anyway, imitation is a form of flattery, in a sense. But anyway, yeah, but yes. it's a very yeah. expensive it can't, it, flattery. Uh, I understand. <laughs> it shouldn't be confused. Uh, yes, no. right. Yeah. But uh, a residential capital ownership plan, based on the true Kelso ESOP logic, would enable you to buy a $100,000 house 
pay for it in a relatively short period of time, and it would cost you, in total, principal, interest, and all, seventy-five thousand. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it is treated as a capital instrument. Today, homes are treated as consumer goods. So you can't uh, depreciate them as you have to. Uh, you can't um, uh, get access to uh, pre-tax credit to pay for them. Um, you can't get reasonable interest rates. The full implementation of uh, capital theory economics or two-factor economics should uh, should bring our interest rates competitively determined down to the two to four percent area, based on the re uh, on on the real realities of the structure of the economy rather than manipulation. Based so, on right. the competitive mm. determination mm -hmm. of the feasibility risk, mm -hmm. instead of the arbitrary use of personal savings, and um, and uh, elite banking. Collateralization. Elitist uh, technology. Mm -hmm. uh, let me mention another that's important. It is utterly ridiculous in a society that discovers, if there ever is such a society, that there are two ways to earn an income uh, and that the other way is through privately owned capital, to have any capital, any capital owned by a governmental agency, mm -hmm. uh, a city, a state, a federal government, uh, whatever. I'm not talking about public domain that is recreational and is for the purposes of, of recreation, but, but property used in production, including property used to live on. Um, thus, the streets, the sidewalks, the subways, the public buildings, the university buildings, the governmental, governmental administration buildings, all should be owned by facilities corporations and the ownership of those facilities corporations should be built into the underproductive people, those who do not currently own capital and who are very poor consumers because they don't have income and they don't have an opportunity to produce. Their, uh, their income comes from trickle down. Until men become angels, as Marx thought could happen, but I see no evidence of it, they seem to be getting more like devils every day. Um, we're not going to be able to, to live well on trickle-down. Anyway, it's contrary to the American Constitution and the idea of democracy. might be that a lot of people feel a sense of insecurity given the economic rationales they're asked to live within creates the devil or the greedy or the insecurities oh, that course. are manifest in no a situation question. that is in a certain sense schizophrenic that's presented right. to the general citizen. You know, I say that the inalienable rights of man include, and this is what the prologue to the Constitution said, the right to life with liberty. The right to life implies, absolutely implies, the right to produce the means of supporting that life. Now, because we have not recognized that and have not recognized that there are two ways to earn income mm. and that the ownership of capital is the dominant way today uh, and that everyone must own some and everyone must collect its wages regularly. Because of that, we're interpreting the right to life with liberty as the right to a biological existence supported on the earnings of other people. Mm. and. Our politicians and our people and our, and our power blocks rush to Washington and say to Congress and, and the president, its presidential administration, uh, we want more money because we need it, more welfare, more trickle down. Thus, the awesome, second most awesome power that a government possesses, the taxing power, is being used increasingly to wrench income from those who earn it and to give it to those who need it. This is a brilliant way to run a society if you're trying to run a socialist or a communist society. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the official policy. It just seems to be what's actually being done in the teeth of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there are other provisions of the Constitution that are equally violated. Equal protection of the laws, equal privileges and immunities. When credit to buy capital to enable yourself to become more productive as a capital worker is absolutely essential to your supporting yourself, do you have equal protection when the rich, who relatively speaking don't need that credit, have access to it in unlimited amounts, virtually, and the poor, the 95% who own no capital, are shut off and don't have it? Uh, and you have come up and seen and worked on it, and you've come up with not only an analysis of the situation, but with practical, in the world, real institutional, uh, institutional structures that can help in the, in, the, in the bridging of this gap, which does, in a very real sense, it would seem to me, earn you the accolade that some have put and said that Lewis Kelso may well be the most American, important American thinker of the 20th century. It very well, well be. And I'm awfully that sorry. That remains to be seen. Well, it may yet be seen <laughs> as this thing begins to flourish, but it would be really, be, it is that there's a revolutionary, a system's large-scale understanding of the problems confronting the American economy and the world economy, uh, along with institutionally viable and uh, institutionally realistic uh, approaches to meeting and solving some of these solutions. That's the mark of a visionary leader. And I would like to just say, at this point, we have not begun to scratch the surface in terms of the elucidating of the implications behind this. We look forward to being able to do that a little bit more in the, cert in the future. One thing I do have to say at this point, unfortunately, in cable television and in the systems of uh, capital intensive cable television and communication systems, we have increasing bandwidth in cable. We don't have unlimited bandwidth. We run right out of time for this segment. I'm terribly sorry we could go on talking easily for 15, 16, 20 hours, or these things should and will no be question. elucidated and uh, uh, increasingly, but it has been my pleasure to be able to present to you in the cable television audience the perceptions of Lewis Kelso visionary, revolutionary uh, thinker. Practical with investment banker. Practical investment banker as well. A, a, a visionary practical investment banker with a, a vision that can help in the transformation of the society in a positive direction in the time just exactly when that society is very much in need of such. And for all of your work over the years, I'd like to thank you very much. And, yes, and particularly for participating here in the conversation series. As I say, I'm terribly sorry we've run out of time for this segment. I do invite you and the cable audience to tune in again next week. As we like to say, there's always good interesting, um, technologically appropriate, and as of this evening, always highly responsible talk uh, here on Conversation. We invite you to tune in again next week, and I've been very pleased to have been able to present to you the perceptions of Lewis Calso, a uh, visionary, practical uh, leader here amongst us in, the, these, uh, la in these years of, uh, of the development of the world. I bring you those Lewis, once again. Thank you very, very much uh, indeed for everything. It's a pleasure. For a moment, I did want